What is going on, guys? It's Brian and Jack with Some Man's Comics, and we have no stranger to the channel. This is the third time they're on, and if you've been living under a rock, you might not know about Kanto, but we're going to tell you all about it in this video. We have the creative team, Rother David Boer, as well as the fantastic artist, Drew Zucker. But before we get to them, I want to introduce the co-host, Jack DeMeo. What's going on, everybody? Yes, we are excited. Like Brian said, we have the creators of Canto, David Boer and Drew Zucker with us. And the greatest thing about Canto is we have loved this book since day one. It's an amazing read. It's doing incredibly well for retailers and for all of you investors out there. It's been burning up the secondary market for over a year. So hopefully you already know. But if you don't know, get ready because we've got more information coming your way. So we say this is the third time, but we get new viewers on this channel all the time. So if you are new here, click that subscribe button and hit that bell notification so you get notified of all the future videos. But the main thing is we want to introduce you to the creators. David Brewer, tell the viewers about yourself real quick before we get into this fun conversation of Canto goodness. I just want to first note, Brian lately introduced me as author David Brewer and fantastic artist Drew Zucker. So maybe <laughs> Priority. Just kidding with you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, first, let me say congratulations to Simple Man's Comics because you guys are at how many subscribers now? Just, just over 18,000. 18,000. That is huge. That's the biggest gathering for what, six months now? Um, <laughs> more, than, more, more than a Trump rally. <laughs> too, too soon, too soon. Um, hi, everybody. My name is David Boer. I'm, a, I'm the co creator and writer on Canto. Uh, if you are a subscriber of the channel, hopefully these guys have been saying nice things about us. Um, yeah, and I did a few things for Vault before uh, moving over to IDW with Canto, and it's sort of been occupying uh, my world for the last. I want to say 14 months now and, and a long time before that. And the sure. fabulous author. Oh, <laughs> fabulous now. Okay. <laughs> I'm just full of adjectives. <laughs> Got the F adjectives. It's, okay. it's Simple Man's Mad Libs up in here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, fantastic uh, artist. Introduce yourself. Uh, Hi guys, I'm Drew. I'm back and there's literally nothing any of you can do about it. Uh, I'm the co-creator of Canto along with David. Uh, I previously worked on a Kickstarter book called The House at, with Philip Seavey. I did a book for Monkey Brain Comics called Skybreaker and like David for the last 14 months, uh, Canto is all that controls my life. <laughs> in the best way possible. I, I do want to say they didn't, I mean, they didn't really sell well enough. David mentioned he worked at Vault, but if you guys haven't read Alien Bounty Hunter, it was on there. And you were another title for them as well also, right? Powerless, yeah. Powerless. I'm an Alien Bounty Hunter fan, so I just give that more credit. <laughs> but, and Drew, the house, I picked that up. I bought a signed copy off your store. Uh, loved, one, I love that it was signed by that fantastic artist, but also, the trade itself was great. And you said there's another volume you guys are working on, right? Uh, there is an idea that we are, let's call it gestating. Uh, we have a pretty solid idea of what it is and what it's going to look like. Uh, it's a matter of finding time right. to really dig into it. It's, it's going to be, we call it a spiritual successor to the house. So yeah, if you're a fan of horror and you're a fan of World War II, definitely check out this trade paperback, The House. But I also want to say, at the end of this show, we are going to be giving away a copy of the San Diego Comic-Con. I promise when you get it, it won't have the glare on it like you see right here. But we're giving a copy of the San Diego Comic-Con Canto Clockwork Fairies one shot. So stay tuned for the end for that. All right, so now Brian has mentioned that we've had you guys on the channel a couple of times, and we've talked Canto, and certainly I think that most of the market should be aware, but let's just say, because we're always trying to grow that reader base, somebody is not aware of our little tin friend. Can you give us like that 90-second elevator pitch on who is Canto and uh, what, what came from this first arc and what has changed for you guys? Sure. Um, so 
Kanto is um, this little guy, a little clockwork knight, and his people have been enslaved. And they're not allowed to have names. They're not allowed to care for one another, have relationships. When they're taken, their hearts are removed and replaced with clocks. So when their time is up, they go into the furnaces. But Kanto, he sort of defies all of that. He has a name. He has a relationship with, um, he's in love with a little tin girl. And when her clock gets damaged beyond repair, he has to go out into his great big world to find where they take their hearts to bring hers back to save her. So it's inspired by Wizard of Oz and Dante's Inferno. And we like to say it's part fantasy, part adventure, and all heart. And that's the first volume. Um, you have to read to find out what happens at the end. But from there, we uh, continue on with our little Clockwork Knight and his future adventures. Now, the first volume came out now. And it, we, talked, we talked off air that... I, we Brian and I like to say nobody didn't like it, but you mentioned, and as kind of creatives do, right? We always remember those negative reviews. Those are always kind of the ones that stick out. But overwhelmingly, this was a well-received book. Uh, it, IDW isn't necessarily thought of as the first place for creator-owned comics, but it definitely dominated the year for IDW in that in that department last year, and really kind of I believe kicked off a year where some several other books then got added spotlight afterwards. And we saw kind of the height of Canto Mania around San Diego Comic-Con time when uh, the very first variant was released. We saw Brian holding up the giveaway for the one-shot variant, which is uh, for, right, that's, that's the one right there that David pointed to. That is that very first San Diego Comic-Con variant that everybody was going nuts for. They were lined up for. Uh, you guys were doing a signing, uh, and we saw it in the secondary market. Still to this day, it is an absolute in-demand book. Now, when the one-shot came out, they obviously, with everything going on with the pandemic, we're not able to have conventions in the same um, in the same manner. But the same sort of event happened with that uh, with that variant because. The, the site was crashing. So many people wanted to get on. And I'm sure people wanted those some of those Peach Momoko variants as well. Not to mention they were asking David and Drew, like, hey, man, what's going on with this site? Like, they, right. like they run it. <laughs> right. But Kanto was one of the first things to sell out. And we see on the secondary market, it's going far and above that original $10, uh, you know, asking price from IDW. So it, absolutely incredible uh, that we've seen that kind of heat continue rolling into what is now we're recording this on new comic book day on the day of the release of the second volume which i feel kind of privileged that we even have you guys in the building today this is this is the release day this is it won't be long one well, it won't be long before they're like on you know the tonight show talking about the movie yeah right seven seasons in a movie that'll be the next yeah we'll be, we won't be able to get them on release day of the film uh, and if they do, they better come in in like orange and blue tuxedos, like right, <laughs> like dumb and dumb or something. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be lucky if we can get like some, you know, some press row type badges, or <laughs> some, like some interviews that week. Don't or, worry, like, we will, we will, we will glance your direction. <laughs> right, right, and we will certainly wear powder blue and orange tuxedos. <laughs> yeah, so that's San Diego Comic Con variant. For this year, it was it was extraordinary. I think once again, <clears throat> you guys have talked a lot about the the printing issue with the first the 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 Canto number one from last year, and which created some scarcity, especially in the high the high grades. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of a sim different issue, but similar when IDW had the website problems, so they couldn't they they launched it once and it didn't work, and then launched it again and didn't work, and then finally on the third day it worked. But I think everybody was like ready to order, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Canto, we were shocked that it was like two minutes or five minutes or something, and they were all gone. And then what was even more surprising was that we had done, the trade had been out for six, four months now. I mean, it's probably yeah. like five or six months. Right yeah. Now. And we had done some signed book plates for the trade. And shortly after the single issue of Clockwork Fairies sold out, the, the trade with the with the signed book plate sold out. And to be honest, I, I haven't seen any on eBay, really. 
I, I think people just wanted that for their collection. And yeah. it, it's mm -hmm. kind of wild to have that sell out when you still have a lot of those other books that were, you know, still there. Well, and I think that contributes to some of the values we're seeing on the secondary market for a lot of Canto stuff is that there's such a collector base now uh, that really is invested in not just reading the story, but now buying the variant covers and, and would be the type of customer that wouldn't just want that regular trade. They'd want the trade with the, the signatures. Right. And that customer base is not letting go of those products. That's staying in their private collection. We certainly have some, some viewers who have been very active, including the viewer Lala, who donated the book today that we're, we're, we're doing for the giveaway. You know, she's been a big, huge Canto supporter and, and fan. And so you have people like that who then they're, they're buying that to keep and then that dries up the market. It, you and I also, David, have talked about how it's funny how every time something comes out Canto, whether it's a variant cover or the new volume, how it spikes back interest in, in, in the original. And we see that this week with Canto number one from the first volume is getting a secondary market spike. There's the, it, all of a sudden copies are selling and selling for uh, 20 to 30 percent higher than they were selling the week before. And I just think that any time that it seems like Canto makes any sort of news, it just gets people going back and they want they want the trade and they want the, the floppies from the original run. Even the, sec the second print of the first volume is starting to get to the point that it's now over cover price. Yeah, and it's 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 always so fun to watch watch this because I think we're you start seeing those spikes when we get reviews for mm -hmm. new material coming out. Our intention with um, the one shot Clockwork Fairies was to essentially show the audience that this is a. I, I've said this a, f a few times, and I'm getting kind of um, fatigued on premise creator owned books as opposed to character creator owned books, you know, character based ones. And I'd rather see a great character you can put into a hundred stories yep. than one story that you have to populate with a hundred characters. And the one shot for us was to prove to the audience that this is Kanto and Kanto is a character who we can put in a bunch of different scenarios and, and stories and just keep going with this. And I think every time you see reviews, there's this, like this underlying current of kind of surprise. It's like, whoa. They did another good Canto story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's supposed to happen. <laughs> so I think that's what maybe we're seeing a little bit. Now, do you guys have a? Do your fans have? Do you have a follower name yet? Like Canto Commandos or? <laughs> no, no, we should come up with one now. Somebody said Cantoverse, which is not the followers. But I was like. Yeah. I, I'm 100% on board with the Cantoverse. Yes, because that, that means you can go a lot of places with, with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I've thought a lot. It's funny that you bring that up, David. So I remember, you know, I think it was our first conversation where you brought up some of your frustration with some of the current releases. I won't name any by name, but that, that you even brought up some specifically. Did I? Off camera. Take but, it off. Uh, yeah. But, I, it but it's funny. I th I've thought about it a lot since then because uh, so many of the solicits that you get for a lot of independent creator owned stuff is you can tell that somebody's thinking, okay, I want to make a post apocalyptic story or I want a story. Right. And, it, and it's really environment based. And they, you can tell that the concept started with the environment and then fills it in with the cast of characters. But my favorite two books that have been created in the last couple of years. And the two books that I- You better say Canto and Canto oh, too. Canto, Canto's in there. But the two <laughs> books that I think that I, I, I've said that I believe wholeheartedly, I make a joke, but I ultimately believe the, a movie's the end all be all here is Canto and Something's Killing the Children, which are very different books. But they're both books where it's just like you said, there's a character at the front and center of the book that it, it, it drives the story. And the character is so unique and dynamic within the story and the different situations you can put the character in that it sets it apart from everything. And I don't think that I really saw that until a while after our initial conversation, but I do think that, that has a lot to do with Kanto and why you've gone off the first volume and then the one shot was amazing. And not only was it, did it get well received, it was, I enjoyed it, but also again, 
of selling over cover price for cover A, the incentive selling above ratio, uh, and a lot of people having trouble finding it in shops. So it, it, it's, it's a complete success from something, a one shot in between two volumes that traditionally in a secondary <clears throat> market would be filler. It's story filler. It's just, you know, it, it, right. but it, far from, from that uh, is what you guys were able to accomplish. And I think that's, that's noteworthy. I, those numbers on clockwork fairies that we saw were, were better than what we expected. Um, you know, it, like David said, it, it, clockwork fairies was meant to serve a few purposes. It was meant to be that in-between story that showed that, this character can function in multiple stories beyond his own uh, his own main adventure, and that the world was bigger than just what we were showing you. It was also designed to before COVID. It was designed to warm up readership and alleviate some of the schedule uh, for production purposes. And we expected it to be well received by the core fan base. Uh, but we did not expect it to be ordered quite as heavily as it was. Yeah, I think our orders were 40% higher than what they had projected. Yeah. And I would still argue 40% lower than what the market was truly showing that they they could have handled. So I yeah. still got yeah. yeah. And, you know, the second print is coming out. I think I just checked the date, and it's like September 2nd which is right between issue one of Canto 2 and issue two of Canto 2. And it was interesting. We got the fire drill email, essentially, that we needed a second print, <clears throat> and it needed to go to the printer. So we didn't have time to actually create another cover. So what you see in the second print is the same cover, but with the little red, the, the corner box is red mm -hmm. instead of um, trans this right here is red in the inside. So that's how you tell print the, the first print from the second print. I was kind of bummed because you always, it's cool to have a new cover for another printing. But then part of me thought, you know what? This is gonna get the book into shops as quickly as we possibly can get it because there's a huge number of orders that have not been fulfilled because mm -hmm. the print one was too low. Right. So for that one, we have the incentive covers, Nick Robles and, um, Mateus Santaluco. Santaluco. Yeah, Santaluco. Um, both amazing covers. And, you know, the collector's market, these, these are great for the collector's market. And if you want this first print, that's great for collectors too. But, again, bottom line is get more people to read it. And having that same cover, so it's almost like a seamless, it's sort of always been there since it came out, I think yeah. is good for us from creator perspective just promise us if you go to a third print we get a fresh cover uh, assuming it doesn't get sprung on us like six comments? hours before it has right. to go in yeah right right i'll tell you what we will blow the doors off with a third print cover if everyone listening can push us to a third printing on it yeah there you that? go there you go <laughs> So I enjoyed the the one shot. I remember reading it, and I remember mm -hmm. as soon as I got done reading, I, I DM David, and I was like, "Hey, does this carry?" Because it I won't say left with the cliffhanger, but it left with kind of a somewhat of an open ending. And I was like, "Hey, is this carrying over into volume two? And he's like, "Not necessarily, but there's some things that might." And what I enjoyed about this the one shot, just as Drew just said, is hey, it kind of lets you know it takes place out of the universe, or it takes place into a bigger universe as well as Cycles. the reader attention. But I like that self-contained story, but it was enough to let you know that, just like Drew said, hey, Canto's bigger and has now, you've seen mm -hmm. that from those experiences from that first arc, how his adventure is evolving and how he can take on more things, how his confidence is kind of, kind of wavering, but has grown so much and that courage is there. And then that does carry over into the first issue of Hollow Man that just came out today. and there's got to be some type of a time jump there, right? Is there, do you have a, in your head, like what that time jump is? Because it definitely seems it's a little bit in the future. Well, yeah. several cycles of full moons. <laughs> that makes sense. There, there, there you go. For, for normal people, it's probably a couple months. <clears throat> gotcha. And not only now, 
I like it because you've seen it like you talk seven seasons in a movie when you see like uh, the a first movie of something that might be concentrated on that one character. Now we get into Hollow Man. Now Kanto has some friends with him. And if the first one was Wizard of Oz, if I'm going to take this on my own and describe it, now we get that Fellowship of the Ring type mission about to kick off within that first issue. Yes or no? Yeah. Mm, yeah. That's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> no. Lord of the Rings yeah. has always been. And I don't want to spoil the issue also, but it's kind well, of. So, uh, I'll say this. My, as much fun as these characters are to draw, the, the most aggravating thing in the world for me is that David went and took my single character project and turned it into a team book. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yes, yes and no, Drew. You know exactly what's happening in this arc. So everybody's talking about it's a team up book, it's a team up book. And every single one of your expectations from Canto in the first arc, we flipped it on its head. Every time we flipped yeah. it on its head. So great. Your expectations are going to be that this is a team book and they're going to go out there and do this team adventure mm -hmm. and it's going to be awesome. Um, I just, just strap in because um, it, it, it's a roller coaster. Uh, and, I will say. <clears throat> yeah. I, I will say the, the way for myself that I describe it is that it is very much, you know, in, not in terms of anything story wise, but in terms of its tone, it is very much Empire Strikes Back, where you s go from a new hope, which tells this very kind of straightforward hero story, and Empire then takes all of those elements and creates these dynamics for the characters to really develop in and for the world the universe that they're in to become that much more complex it is very much the same thing here in what we're doing it may be less issues than volume one but it really feels more dense and more complex and like there's more story in those five issues so what you're saying is the antagonist is actually Kanto's father yes <laughs> oh my god what got what got it's me? not it's not so i'm not gonna take that right off the table because i right? guess that drew you need to sit me down we're gonna watch nine star wars movies and we're gonna do something different <laughs> the the for me the thing that got me excited it with with the second volume is the new characters the introduction of new characters so I know I have to be the one who brings up the ugly money secondary market aspect of this, but it, this is the thing that I think everyone's overlooking today. Today, again, we, I've said this before, we're recording this on New Comic Book Day. And I've had a lot of conversations with my reselling, my retailers, my investor buddies about this book. And, you know, everybody loves the story, but the comment you get as far as any sort of long-term value is, oh, yeah. I, I definitely think Canto will be a movie, but that's why I'm grabbing volume one, first print. That's the book to grab. But here's the thing. We get introduced to now a much larger world and, and more characters. And when the Cantoverse becomes an actual thing, we don't know we're gonna, which of these characters we're going to see. And I think there is some serious investment opportunities in this issue with some of these, these new characters. I think you're right. <laughs> we happen to know where the story is going. Right. You would be the one to know, right? Yes. And I don't want to uh, tip our hands with any of it. Yeah. But what I will say is <clears throat> my particular brand of storytelling is I do not like to throw characters in there and then just move on. Mm -hmm. So there is, I like to explore what the consequences of different characters, whether when they come into the story, when they leave the story, when, if they come back in, like what has happened since that time, what are the ramifications for choices that they make and that sort of thing. And I think you're definitely going to see that as we go along. So I think you're 100% correct that, um, that th there is an opportunity here for um, quote unquote first appearances because that suggests there is a second and appearance and more that that was that was my gut feeling reading the issue reading the issue i sat there and said this is one of those sneaky issues where if there becomes a movie some of the beloved characters from that movie 
may not appear in that first issue that everybody's chasing. They may appear right here in this issue. And that would be the type of thing that misses the general public. And it's another reason why if you were sleeping on it from a secondary market perspective, you may want to go, I know you grabbed your reader copy out there, but grab your second copy, grab that third copy and get them in the short box behind me. Uh, so you're stocked up, ready to go for that, for that seven seasons in a movie. Uh, I, I, I will say also that, you know, like, like David said, we, it, he isn't big on just introducing characters just to throw them away. And personally, neither am I. And I will say that anyone that we introduce into this world is complex and, you know, has their own motivations, their own fears, hopes, all that stuff. And I really feel that with everything that we've been doing going forward, that these characters are individually as complex and interesting as Canto on his own. Canto just happens to be who we're following as the main protagonist of this story. But ultimately, all of these characters have their own little quirks to them. Uh, it's in the writing and it's in the design of them. It, it's all very intentional as to make them their own thing. Now, one thing I wanted to bring up also, we've talked about it the past couple of times you've been on here, is Canto is often maybe solicited or described would say as an all ages comic, right? Which you could see that, but I like, I think it's more of a multi-generational comic. I think it spans multiple demographics. We've discussed that before. I picked up the trade. I've got picked up a couple copies of the trade this past summer. My eight year old sat down and read it and I can't get him to read hardly anything. That's not Pokemon. And he loved it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the one shot. I enjoyed the issue that came out today. And I, like I said, from, any age group and any person that we've asked to read it and we'll just say, hey, let us know. Read it. And if you don't like it, let us know. Mm -hmm. You guys have had different different uh, scenarios there. But everyone that we've talked to have turned it on or had picked up the book, even if it was just one copy, have all enjoyed it. And not only does David write a great story with great dialogue and it's one that keeps you moving, but that combined with, you know, that fantastic, that fantastic artist, Drew Zucker. <laughs> the visuals in there, they just combine, it. it just makes a great story that helps the, the book flow. And I, we, I personally always talk about nostalgia on this channel. And that reminds me, this story reminds me of my childhood growing up and mm -hmm. all those great movies or stories, whether it's Never Ending Story or Goonies or Princess Bride. This kind of has that same type of feel to it. And that's what we keep telling our viewers. I, yeah, I yeah, I I think that uh, maybe it's just you know getting older, but a lot of movie reviewers who are around the same age as us uh, and grew up with that stuff, I've seen them kind of become quote unquote the cranky person. <laughs> uh be, because me. they right be, because they look back to the 80s they look back to what they grew up with with such fondness and what they see today kind of bugs them i i see the argument for that but at the same time i think part of what we did was we reached back to what what worked from those 80s movies and what appealed to us so much from them. And there are elements to that that are, that are better than what's done today. And there's stuff that's better today than what was done back then. But we kind of look back at what were the best elements of that. And I think what works is that we, we brought those best elements into kind of a modern, a modern interpretation of it. And that's what's helping it connect with both generations. And everyone wants to root for the underdog. Understog underdog right. stories are always great. Yeah, that, that never that, changes. Yeah, and that was specifically... <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like sometimes people just think that, um, you know, that sometimes these books, you just... They, this, we sort of stumble into success or, you know, and there is no formula for it. But there were specific choices that we made early on. They get, you know, character design, he's small in a huge world. You know, mm -hmm. automatically, it's like... The child from Mandalorian, I, <laughs> I look at the child on the screen and I was like, I will flip this table if anything <laughs> happens to my child. And that's just, that's character design and the little gestures and things. So that was specific. 
we made, I don't know if I, t- I, I mentioned this on our, our previous uh, episodes, but the specific choice that we made that he was going to go on an adventure that wasn't about him and it wasn't about saving him, it was about saving somebody else. And automatically that selfless goal gets you more behind him as a reader yes. and more wanting him to succeed. And that's sort of who Kanto is to the core. Um, for me, all ages is about layers and that's becoming clearer and clearer to me. So a kid who's eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old might read Canto number one or Canto the, if I only had an arc, the first arc and might see a hero's journey and a big adventure and somebody who wants to save somebody else he cares about. Somebody who's in their 20s, 30s, an adult will look at that and see the slavery that's going on, the oppression, the love, the selflessness, that maybe those layers are lost on a 10-year-old, but they're not gonna be lost on a 30-year-old. That's the same thing that we're gonna continue to see in Canto 2. It's gonna be, I mean, this is, this is not really a spoiler because it was advertised and everything, but they're, cl- they're free now and their clocks are cursed so that they will slow down and eventually stop unless they return to captivity. And so you have this adventure that kids are gonna look at and they're gonna say, oh, he's gotta lift the curse. He's gonna go on an adventure, he's got friends. And older readers are gonna look at it and say there's layers about you know, the limited time we all have here and what would you do if you could save somebody else who you knew their time was you know, coming to an end and those sorts of things. And would you make the choice between going back to something that's t- terrible if that means that you can continue you know, living and existing. And to me, that's all ages. And I feel like sometimes I was on a, I was on a Twitter chat, which is just like, don't do it. How well did that work out for you? Don't (laughs) do it. And somebody said, um, it was all like, oh, um, the, the New York Times bestseller list is filled with all ages comics. And I'm like, "Mm." I don't think those middle grade, a lot of those middle grade graphic novels really, does, does Diary of a Wimpy Kid really have, you know, all those different layers to it? I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna pass judgment one way or the other. But I just see that that's missing in comics. And then the other comment, this is my soapbox and I'll get right off. Um, the other comment was, you can't really do how can you do kids' comics in single issues? They're just going to tear it apart. And I was just like, for the last 50 years, kids would roll up comics and put it in their back friggin' pocket because it's got Superman in it or Batman or Spider-Man or all these things. And have we really gotten to a place where we don't want to give kids our single issue comics because they're going to tear them to pieces? Tear them to pieces. I mean, there's some, you guys, the investors of the channel are like, oh my God, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's no, true. Reader, but no, awesome. but it, it, it's, I always think the key to the lifeblood of the hobby is the next generation. The generations have to turn over. And it, it, you're not going to have kids buying floppies to read if, if, yeah, if everything is that kind of bag and board culture. There's still right. to be some of that traditional um you know read a comic it's funny because i use that all the time um I, I somebody that like i've talked to and interviewed it's donny cates and i've always described him to people as he's a comic book rolled up in your back pocket <clears throat> kind of guy They're like that's the way he views the comic market he's never gonna see the same value in in, in a book the way that i do um because that's what a comic book represents to him it represents something to read and then put in your pocket and move and move on um but it i i think that hitting the all ages and the different angles we've talked about that on, on the channel a few times when uh, we've been talking about it on whether it's the bolo show or some of the new release stuff now i read it with my my oldest my nine-year-old daughter and it's funny what you said david is hits me on the head we really took different things from the book as we read it together and so at we would read we would read it like read an issue and then talk about it and it was really funny and interesting to watch how 
we're reading two totally different stories, but reading the same story. And I think that's a Pixar movie to me, because when you look at, I watch a lot of those movies with my kids these days. And when, when you look at a movie like Onward or Monsters University, there's always messages that adults are able to pick up on. And we understand what they're trying to say with the film and the story. And then the kid is still just seeing these cute, fun monsters going on adventure. Right things mm -hmm. and i really that's why i think canto is just the perfect vehicle to tell such a positive and heartwarming story that the whole family can get behind and yeah it's unfortunate that it's not and i agree with also with what you said so brad and i are big advocates of of all ages comics in general and even even like the diary of a wimpy kid and the smile and all that that stuff's great but there needs there's there isn't a bridge between the two so the problem you get is as your kid those books are great to get kids to start reading comics, to get them interested in, in the books. But then how do you transition them from that to what I would say that next level where you're getting those nuanced stories with Canto? The problem is you're not getting Diary of a Wimpy Kid sold in comic stores with the same ferocity. Right. And you're not getting Canto sold in Barnes and Noble with the same <laughs> ferocity. So because you can't get those two products to meld you're having to, and it's unfair to you guys that you guys get beat at every award show by a product that's not really competition um that's what you're seeing i i always watch that when i watch the all ages awards it's it's always one of these books that's coming from a publishing house outside of traditional mm -hmm. monthly release comics um well, they also have categories of adult and kids and it's right. like when are we gonna have, I thought about that today. We, we're, when are we gonna have like an age story that's appropriate for kids and kids will enjoy and, and you know, adults will enjoy too. Um, the other category I thought of was editor. Why don't we have best editor? Oh yeah, because that's a, that's a serious job. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So to, to your point about all that, uh, I, and th this isn't me being, an arrogant jerk about it or anything. I personally oh, for, believe that for once, I was waiting. I was waiting. Yeah, not non fantastic writer. Get in your corner, okay? You had your soapbox. Yeah, <laughs> pushes me off uh, the box. <laughs> Knock you over the head with it. Yeah. Uh, I, I personally, it, when we when we started on Canto, so much of it was designed to have that exact experience that that you guys have had with it with your kids it was designed as to get the the 9 10 year old invested in it even if they didn't fully understand it so that when they come back to it at 30 years old they take totally different things from the story the irony of this industry is that it's the majority superheroes and it desperately needs saving uh i'm a big believer that canto's long-term legacy though will be that it was one of the first books to attempt to actually trailblaze with indirect market this sort of this sort of genre and this sort of book and it like i said it's not me being arrogant about the work that we're doing it's us taking a very hard look at where the industry's at and what we personally feel like the industry needs and the type of story that we want to tell. <clears throat> we both believe in this book down to our core. I don't draw 18 hours a day because I hate what I do. You know, I do it because you I- draw 18 have... hours a day because I hate what you do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, I do it because I absolutely adore the product. I'm not investing two years, three years of my life into something that I'm not invested in. But to me, all these books, all these all ages books that are on the outside coming from outside publishers, they can continue to do what they're doing. I think Canto's lifespan is much longer than just its initial release because of the direct market and because people keep discovering it you brought up a good point how you talking about kids reading it now and then 30 years from now picking it back up again and how we have stuff like like to me one of those type books is and its simplicity is like the giving tree right everyone mm -hmm. remembers that from their childhood i can 
yes, our kids will still know that book, but this to me could be that same nostalgia type feel where, <clears throat> hey, I remember this book as a kid. And then as right. they get older, like, oh yeah, I remember, you know, even if they kind of had stuff that happened, but then go back and remember it and how great they enjoyed it. And always talking about nostalgia. Nostalgia drives me in my collection. So I always love reverting back to it and talking. It, uh, but yeah, that's another thing brings up a good point where you never know how it's affecting kids now. And then when they do read it that, at that age, then they're going to get what you were saying, David, where they're going to get some type, something else out of the story now from what they remembered when they were a kid. And my kids love doing the coloring pages that you guys actually put out as well. That was a yeah. big, that was a big hit in my household. I still say we need a Canto coloring book from IDW. Ahem, ahem. IDW. Anyone listening uh, at the office? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Seven seasons in a movie and a Canto coloring book and Funko Pops. Right. I want a whole yeah. aisle at Target. Yeah. The and then Cap. Right. Action figures, yeah. Funko Pops, vehicles. I want a stuffed Malorex that's big enough that a kid can ride on. I, I, I want a stuffed Malorex that my dog will tear to pieces. Yeah. But see, the reason why I think that all of that is obtainable is exactly what you guys talked about, about from <clears throat> character design to like the passion for the project. Everything you guys have done is deliberate. Everything has been intentional. Every, the story is laid out that way. The character is laid out that way. And then the art is done that way. When you read the book, sometimes you read stories and there's, there's almost like this disjointed feel between what the writer is trying to say and what the artist is depicting. Mm -hmm. And with you guys, there's very much a connective feel where it's, it's almost as if what David's writing, he's also drawing. And that is unique. And I think it's part of the secret sauce of the book and why it's, very easy when you guys are trying to make a point or trying to drive an emotion you're able to do that um because of the way everything works together so you can tell like when you tell us things like and you've done it now on multiple interviews where you guys have talked about like your process where you talk about like you know intentionally doing things like making the character small and what that then the challenges that brings in his world uh you see that play out and that consistency play out right it's not like a, a it's not a, there's cheap tropes that people use because they'll use them for a moment or an individual scene but these are consistent themes throughout it throughout the story and i think that that makes a big difference and i think that all of that lends to why you have a fully flushed character and now an expanding world and universe, which is exactly, again, what I, I think Hollywood is looking for when they're looking for this kind of stuff it is, is they're looking for a complete picture and a complete story. And I think you get that you have a character that you love. And I think you have a, a, a world now in which you can kind of understand where he lives and, and the scope of everything and where it can go. Yeah, it made me feel so good um, today when I was, I, I saw today's, again, it's New Book Comic Book Day. This, this is going to come out a couple of days after, but um, there is, a, you know, these little micro reviews. I saw one on, on YouTube about the um, releases this week. And can, it was, Canto was one of them. And, and this, uh, re, this person really um, loved the first arc. And it made me feel so good when he read Canto 2, his first issue, and he said, it just feels like Canto. It feels like a Canto yeah. story. It's true to what we tried to do in the first, you know, arc, and it just gives you the same sort of react, emotional reaction to it. Um, and so I really feel like Drew and I have done our jobs, which was to reassure readers that this is going to be another emotional, exciting roller coaster of a story same way we did in the first arc yeah so the first issue first issue the first volume had a great ending wasn't a happy ending but it was a great ending what can you tell us without totally spoiling what we can expect with the second volume and is there gonna be what does the future hold for canto past the second volume i told you i was gonna off camera, I told you I was going to drag you for our exclusive on mainframe about the future of the stories. So. <laughs> I know, come again, you hold that over, over our heads forever. <laughs> so, it's hard to do it, David. Yeah, Comic Andy. Comic Man Andy to be. Comic Man Andy. There we go. That's right. 
Um, I feel like if we gave you any real information about where the story is going in this arc, it's it's too much. Give us the USA Today. You know, if you had the trail and you started seeing the the word blurbs coming up there, and like, hold on to your pants. This, oh, I, you know, give oh, us it, some it, taglines. It's a tour de force. Yeah. <laughs> tour de force. I love it. Um, watch out for Canto's dad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he lost You're not off. doing that, Brian. You're not doing that. Um, so what I will say is that we have very, very specific plans as to where this Canto saga is going to go. And a lot of people don't, didn't, don't, under, don't realize that there were things that we have planned out since before even the first arc came out. So we had very, very clear ideas of where this story was going. And the great thing, I think, with that first arc is it's, it's open-ended, but it's also closed-ended. So I've seen comments from readers where they say, if it was just that volume, they would have been satisfied. But it's open to, to more story. And we've, already intended, we've always intended to tell more story. So I will say that this volume will end in a way that the Kanto saga will continue and come to a conclusion at <laughs> a point down the road. I'm it's a story. Super vague about it. Super vague. <laughs> they um, say it's a story. Be, there, there's going to be a, a book, and Kanto will be in it. <laughs> I will say also. He's referring to Comic Man Manny's mainframe Comic Con panel with it. They did a fantastic job on there. If you guys want to check that panel out, Comic Man Andy, his own YouTube channel, actually has that up there where you can catch that exclusive tidbit. And it's up there right now on Comic Man Andy's Comic Man Andy's YouTube channel. And I feel I feel so bad about being so vague about it. Um, just keep in mind there is more, there's more story, and we are actually working behind the scenes right now to um just figure out how we want to structure that story as we go forward. So um, I guess just take that as you will. There's it, not, there, there is mo there's more story than you think there actually is. And so that will become clear. That will become clear. Yeah. And that's exciting because, again, when this whole thing started, that you know, one of the things that the people would say as a negative to invest would be, well, it's only a six-issue miniseries, right? So it's not going to – it's going to be a, here for a moment and then it's gone. This is – this is obviously something that's a commitment, and IW's shown a commitment as well because not only have we seen one in ten incentives, we've seen one in twenty-five incentives on the last two number ones. So uh, obviously they've seen the success, but we still need to see more from IDW because we want to see we want to see more Canto. We want to see we want to see more cool trade dress stuff. We want to see more uh, uh, trade paperbacks. We need a hardcover. We're gonna need we're gonna need all of that fun fun stuff coming out, but uh, we we want the lock and key crossover. Oh man, I'm <laughs> telling you. Oh, I already have. Yeah. Hey, everybody involved with lock and key, we're here. <laughs> um, I have the I have the um, Canto Bodhi crossover ready to go. <laughs> ready that would to go. be amazing. That would be amazing. We've been working on a a, a very the heart key. Come on, the heart key. There you go. I'm telling you, we've been working. We've been working on a variant cover for Sandman and Lock and Key crossover. I would love to do Lock and Key and Canto. That would be okay, amazing. Put a, well, put a key in the back of Canto's head. It's perfect. It's right there. Well, if we're talking about putting things out into the universe, I, I would just say I want the three issue TMNT Usagi Ojimbo Canto. <laughs> there you go. In each world. And, then, and when it's, you know, it's all IDW, so I, that can happen. We can make that happen. I mean, I, you know, some people give them a call. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've just got to get Nickelodeon to sign off on that deal, and it's a fun yeah. one. I'm always afraid to say anything on, on your guys' channel because then you see the prices start spiking. <laughs> There's going to be a major crossover. Oh, that's, right. that's, that's, the news, that's, that's the news on the speculation sites tomorrow is going to be <laughs> Oh my God. crossover. Okay. Company-wide. I'm going to cut that sound bite and it's just going to be on Instagram. And <laughs> right. 
I can just see the email from our editor going, what did you do? <laughs> and then you can do I mean, this emoji. Smart, they would email us and be like, this is a great idea. Let's do it. Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> and, then, and then be like, hey, just look at the, look what the homage cover for number one that Ben Bishop did is doing. People like this connection. Let's make it happen. There you go. This cover is just going crazy today. Yeah. It's People. selling it's selling higher than the one in twenty five. And the one in twenty five is a great cover. It's an amazing cover, right? I love I love this cover. We love that cover. Um we have been talking behind the scenes uh, a little bit of the investor side of things on the you know, the Ben TMNT one in ten versus George Keltsudis, who did the one in twenty five. What would happen if we flipped them? And I I mean, I don't I don't know if I have a take on it yet. Do you do you guys? I don't know, like, tr- like traditionally you would want your best variant to be your highest ratio variant, right? That would be your thought. But it's always tough when you're looking at variants and you're deciding, well, what's your best variant? Because right. the one in 25 is gorgeous and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And I kind of liked the idea when you guys initially put the solicit of the, the homage being the one in 10, because whether people knew Ben Bishop or were aware of his art, I'm a huge Ben Bishop fan, but whether people were aware of him and his art, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles connection is going to get them right off the bat. So I felt like doing that was smart because every store is going to order at least 10. You got to mm-hmm. order at least 10. You would think that, that that would guarantee you and lock you in there. So I think you guys did the right thing. And now looking at the prices, we talked about it off air. With at the cost to retailers, they're break even on this book just because of the Ben Bishop. You're profiting if you order 25 copies. You're profiting based on your one in 25 sale before you've even sold a single regular issue, and that allows you to do things like you know run special promotions for the book to get it in the hands of readers. You can you know if you go heavy enough on the order and order enough variants, you make enough money, you feel good. You can do things like free giveaways with the with the regular book all kinds of free speaking free of free giveaways there you go i think now is a great time to do the giveaway for that canto san diego comic-con glare free <laughs> <laughs> clockwork fairies I got the lights here but this was donated for a giveaway from not only one of the great members of the Superman's comics community i'm talking like always commenting always watching i'm if there's it's like jack brian and then la la schultz i mean she's right there with with us like not even extended family she's primary simple men's comics family she says she's the number one canto fan but she's gonna have to be number three after jack and I. yeah right but she's number five after me and drew too there yeah. you go. Um, i just want to throw in real quick that i got a dm this morning from um, so Lala Schultz, Laura, and I are um, buddies now, and she sent me a DM this morning, and um, she just said, "Happy Canto to release day." Yeah, emojis. I just thought yeah. it was a, very what nice. Great, what a great right. thing for me, and just how wonderful she is. So she, she sent me you. something similar. Yeah, and then oh, um, now I now I. No, it wasn't as great as yours because she's not our, she's y'all's number one fan, not ours. But <laughs> and I just told her, hey, thanks a lot. You know, busy day at work, and you know, you always end up brightening people's day because that's the type of person she is. And it's just going to show that she's giving away this book that we we talked about that story where her and I were like teaming up for that IDW site, going one of us are going to get us copies, and we ended up both getting them. So she's like, hey, since we both got them, I want to donate this book, and she sent you know, this awesome little letter. And it says, four score and seven years ago, not really, but Simple Man's <laughs> Comics, when you can bring joy into someone's life, you should. I hope this Canto comic will put a smile on another fan's face. Heart, number one Canto friend, Lala, P.S., thank you for all you do. So that just goes to show what we were just talking about with her and how great she is for the community. So here's what we're going to do for... Uh, this is going to be an easy giveaway, right? For those of you watching this, if you're listening to the audio version on the podcast, you want to go to YouTube for this video. It's going to be up there. And in the comments, all you got to do is put, I love Canto. And everyone that does that will be entered. We'll randomize the list and we'll pick one lucky winner to get the San Diego Comic-Con exclusive. And this is a great book, right, Jack? 
I mean, oh, yeah, B big book, big book. I mean, you were talking about a book that was selling well over triple digits. Come down some as most of the San Diego Comic Con variants have, but you're talking about a major book here. And this is, I can't remember what was the print run on it, like 200, 300. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just 300 micro print. Brian and I do exclusive variants. Uh, we and we cannot print 300 IDW exclusives, you have to be IDW to do that. Our minimum print is 1,000 copies, so this is extremely limited. This is a big time book and a book that's going to be a major collectible for a long time. Can it's I just my, add? It, can, it, I, can I add to this? No, no, no. <laughs> get out of here. Absolutely. I just want to throw in. I will sign a copy of the A cover and send it to you guys for whoever wins it so that they have a copy to read. Dave, awesome. That's awesome. San Diego Comic-Con variant. And if you guys aren't following David Boo and Drew Zuck on Instagram, make sure you guys do because they do giveaways on there a lot. And if they're not doing giveaways, they're doing fundraisers that are going to worthy causes. So check those out. I know I got the same as Lala did too. I'm telling you. We got those signed trade paperbacks with that Canto pen that they were selling for San Diego Comic-Con. But we got our signed by that awesome author, David Boer. Oh, in total oh, yeah. silence awesome after author. that. Yeah, that's, that's it. Awesome 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 awesome. Awesome. That's it. <laughs> so All again, right. comment on the video. I love Canto, and you'll be entered to win. We're going to pick two winners now, one for that San Diego Comic-Con exclusive, and one for that signed copy for you to read or hide away in your collection, but we hope you guys read it. And speaking of that San Diego Comic-Con exclusive, everyone knows we got San Diego in July, but in the fall, we normally have New York Comic-Con. So we also have an exclusive that you want to show for that, right, David? Yeah, so um, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that happens with IDW books is um, in the inside front cover of, the issue, of each issue, they print all the different covers that are coming for that particular issue. So if you look inside the front cover of Canto 2 number one, you'll see that there's been seven of these covers revealed, but not number eight. So I just wanted to give Brian and Jack at Superman's Comics a true exclusive. Yeah, take so that comment. Man. Comic man. Man. <laughs> 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 they can that over them, but this is, the New York Comic Con exclusive cover for um, uh, Canto 2, number one. And Oof. it's a sweet cover that we um, got inspired by uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, so that's, that's our inspiration for this gorgeous uh -huh. cover that it was Drew um, on art and uh, Vittoria Estonian colors. Nice, got the home team working on it. And that'll be available on the IDW website. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. In, in theory. <laughs> yes, because I think New York Comic Con has been officially canceled. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming yeah. they're going to be doing the same um, type of online uh, Hunger Games that. Right. Lala, <laughs> Lala, Wonder Twins. <laughs> but, so there you go. So. That's awesome. I love that cover. Awesome New York Comic Con. I think that's a great way to kind of bring this to a close. We also want to thank you guys for coming on the channel for the third time. Um, we hope there's a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Yeah. You guys are welcome on this channel anytime because it seems like each time we have you guys on, it just gets better and better. We have more fun with each other. And it's always great to talk about fantastic character in Canto, right, Jack? Oh, definitely. And one that's ever evolving and growing. Um, it, it, there's a lot of people we could bring on the channel. And if we were to try to have three interviews about the same subject would be very difficult. But even just with the issue that released today, we're going in new directions. Uh, there's so much going on. So it's, it's so exciting. I can't wait. And I know that there'll be fourth and fifth and sixth interviews because there's so much more that, that, that we're going to be needing to talk about. And eventually, when you guys get too big to come on the channel, because no matter how many subscribers we grow, we're not going to be able to keep up with your future Hollywood careers that are <laughs> undoubtedly coming for you two future executive producers. To be like, damn, uh, we really? always you gotta toss the keys, park around back. Park <laughs> right. around back. Well, we always like you. coming on here. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, if we get four more of these, 
then we're, we're due for a movie ourselves, right? Because it'd be right, right, seven right. in a movie. I was going to say, seven interviews in a movie. <laughs> right, right. Civil right. Man's Comics presents Camden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Too bad. It's too bad VH1 is gone. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go, David and Drew, I want to give you guys both anything you guys want to talk about, anything you want to plug, let our viewers know where to find. Let, give them your pitch. We, I don't think you really need to because we've been talking about how great Canto is. But if you said, hey, this is why you should pick Canto up today, what would you say, David? This is why? Why, we should, why you should pick up Canto? Sure. Too? Um, because it's not going to be on the shelf tomorrow. <laughs> That's, a That's a good answer. idea. That's a really great answer and a true one. Yeah. And thanks for saving my crappy question. <laughs> what was your question? It was that, but I was just like, yeah, okay. tell me why you should buy it. <laughs> pick it up. You guys know. Pick it up because it's not going to be there tomorrow. That's great. Through closing I remarks. Say, I would say pick it up because it's, it's good. It, you know, not, not tooting my own horn here, but it, it's good. And it's different from everything else that's out on the market. And, you yeah. know, ho if we did our jobs right, hopefully you feel like you really got your money's worth out of it. And that's from our end. That's all we really care about is, you know, making sure that the fans don't feel like we gypped them on any conceivable level, and that we gave them something that they enjoyed start to finish. I like how your answer makes mine look like I'm a total, total jerk. Well, it. It just, you are, it's, well, you I, went backwards because I'm, I'm the, I was the one that had like the dumbass question. <laughs> no, I, hey, I like it. I like it because that's the truth. It ain't going to be there tomorrow. So you better get it today. You, you have the practical answer in David and the emotional from me. And you guys can direct all your hate to David. Right. That's the balance, right? That's, yeah. that's, what, that's what Brian and I do. I always say, I'm the bad cop. I'm the one who has to <laughs> talk about the money aspect and, uh, and, and all of that. So. But seriously, though, it's, it doesn't stay on the shelf. So if you really want to read it, and we really want you to read it, um, pick up that copy when you see it, because that's really the only way that we can get you. I mean, we can praise it all we want, but until you open these gorgeous pages that Drew and Vittorio and Darren have put together, and I just come along for the ride, you're not going to know really what we're talking about until you do that. Yeah. And make sure also, you let just comic book stores yeah. know. Hey, if they're not ordering, let them know you want them to order it for you. For sure. And that's why we've got the last call show right here on Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel talking about FOC. Make sure you are making your LCS aware before the FOC cutoff date that you want to get in on Canto. And that way your store can be ordered and make sure they've got those copies. And if you do miss out on that first print, stay tuned to see if there's going to be a second print. You're going to want to get right in on that early as well. Drew, you get the last words. Uh, I just wanted to put it out there. Uh, congratulations to our letterist, Darren Bennett, who was nominated for a Ringo Award today. Oh, awesome. uh, in addition to his Eisner nomination, he just, the, the guy deserves every accolade that you can throw at him. He's, he's that good. And in addition to just being that talented, he's a great supporter of other talent that works underneath him. So there's guys. Once again, thanks to David and Drew for coming on to talk more Canto. We will have them on again in the future. With that being said, guys, this is Brian Jack with Submits Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.